Anya Hertz. I'm the director of the Rec Innovation Lab. I'm also an associate professor of entrepreneurship at Miramar College, and I lecture <clears throat> entrepreneurship at San Diego State University. And I think what I'll do now is I'll pass it on. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we record these uh, workshops and these videos are open to everyone. The vast majority of the people in the workshops typically are students at the Rec Innovation Lab or San Diego State University. And, um, but like I said, everyone is welcome. Uh, we have uh, student interns who are responsible for putting all of this together. And so I'm going to uh, pass it on to Angela who can introduce the interns and tell us a little bit about what we've got in store for us today. Thank you, Tanya. My name is Angela Merkins, and I am a student with the Rec Innovation Lab uh, intern. This is my first semester. And today I'd like to introduce uh, Stu Klott. He's the founder and CEO of the Organizational Business Coach. And uh, Stu began his journey back in 2010, and he's going to share with us how he discovered his passion and um, how he established his business and different strategies and branding uh, practices he's used in his business. So we're really excited to have Stu here with us today. And um, I'd like to pass it over to Carmen on my team here. Yeah, thank you, Angela. Um, so I'm Carmen Marquez. I'm an intern student at the, at the Rec Innovation Lab, which is a startup incubator located at San Diego Miramar College. We're led by Tanya Hertz, um, who is constantly encouraging all of us as students and interns at the REC. And it's, a, it's an honor to have her as an example of entrepreneurship. And I'm gonna pass it on to Nona. It's Carmen. Hello, my name is Nona. I'm also a student at San Diego Memorial College, part of the REC. And um, I'll be posting several surveys in the chat. I have a survey monkey for the REC and I also have Stu's survey, if y'all can answer that right now. That would be great. I'll do it. Oops. I'll post it in the chat right now again for those who came a little bit later. Mm -hmm. And Stu, if you're ready for us, that'll be great. Take and it away. Hmm? Sorry, what was that? <laughs> oh, sorry. I was just, uh, just to clarify, uh, you want us to go ahead and complete your survey right now, Stu, the one that says Stu survey? Yeah, that'd be great because then okay. I get more feedback from you guys right away. And you'll see the, the questions are more pertain to what you're doing right now. And then I'll have a little more uh, to talk about. Right, and then the other survey that Nona put in there, we'll do at the end of the workshop when we're all done. So thank you so much for being here, Stu. I, I, I won't take any more of your time. Uh, take it. Yeah, that's all right. Um, thank you for having me, first off. Uh, this is my second one, so I feel a lot better this time. You know, broke the ice last time. But uh, a little bit more about me. I am a graduate of Mesa College, uh, 2009. Uh, I actually graduated high school 2001 back in Pennsylvania, and uh, I did a couple semesters of uh, university over there, and it's actually three semesters. Decided it wasn't for me. I wanted to do something new. I moved, packed up my truck. I moved to California, uh, 2004, and then I spent a couple years working around different uh, bike shops. I had a little experience in bicycles, and uh, and then I put myself through a associate's program at Mesa College. Uh, finished that in 2009. From there, I was going to go to bachelor's and kind of go to state college. And I was like, you know, I found this hole in the market in the bicycle industry. And what was happening in San Diego was there's tons of bike shops. No one was solving the need for fast turnaround in repair. So I learned how to be a really good bike mechanic. And then with a hundred bucks in my pocket and the pickup truck I had to drive across the country with, and a small little toolbox. I started knocking on doors and going out to bike paths and actually uh, what was most successful in branding was uh, I handed out bananas and water on the bike paths. Uh, on a random weekend, I would just hand them out to runners, walkers, families, bikers, and it branded uh, uh, my business as the banana guys. So as goofy as it sounds, uh, it actually brought more of a, a community base to my brand. So people would think about me and the first thing they'd be, go, oh, that's the guy that hands out bananas. So I did that for uh, once a week for five, uh, five years solid and then up to seven years uh, a little bit. We, we kind of died down after that because I didn't need to really go out and market. But that was a marketing and branding ploy. So it was actually, uh, it was able to do in my business because my customers were out there on the bike path. So um, that's how I found out about, you know, really branding from nothing, from scratch. It cost me practically nothing. Um, so 
I learned a lot through that. Uh, you're able to really talk to your clients and see what they really want. So what I did was uh, I love branding. I think it's uh, one thing that you can do in many ways and do it right. Uh, it's hard to do it wrong if you're at least trying. So what I did was put together um, a, a presentation that kind of puts together some of the things that I learned and, uh, and hopefully we can uh, learn from it. Hopefully I teach a couple things here today. So let's see, how do I, uh, let's see, full share. Oh, how do I do full, full screen? There we go. You got it. And then I think I turn this down like that. Looks good. Looks good All on right. our show. Yeah. So I picked donuts because why not? Donuts is something right away. You think donuts. You think, oh my God, my mouth waters, right? Uh, so it's a good analogy. Uh, you know, I had bikes. So you're thinking about bikes. You're thinking about you, most of your businesses are online. So it's gonna be a little bit more of a challenge, but this is a good analogy. Donuts. You know, you first think of donuts, you're going to think you got to have a beautiful picture to make your mouth water. So think about as an analogy, you need something to make your audience mouth water, right? Uh, so this is a donut shop as just an analogy, kind of a little theme going with. So first off, uh, branding, um, the importance of branding. Uh, it makes it unique. It makes your business unique. It's going to stand out from your competitors. When done right, it separates you from your competition while simultaneously attracting the customer close to your business without you even trying, right? The branding must speak to your target market, but it's easier said than done. The challenge is keeping the message specific, but broad enough to blanket a wide range of potential customers. So we're gonna get into a little bit of that uh, because wide range per segment of customers, this is important. So uh, something that I found uh, from Alan Kaiser, uh, this is pretty interesting. Most online retailers have a personalization technology, but few know how to effectively use it. Uh, out of this study, 144 e-commerce executives interviewed for a study, only 17% had a plan to develop a personalized experiences. While 64% of retailers have the technology, they tend to lack the process and rigor needed to execute their personalization efforts. Now, if you think about this, if you you guys are in, you know, in this innovation program, if you're at all spending some time per week, ideally, I like to say one hour a day average, that equals eight hours a week. Sounds like a lot, but that's really what you have to think about branding. If you're doing that, you're already ahead of 64% of these people that are out there right now. So this is important um, as you go through this. Uh, David Feldman said uh, from Forbes, a brand is much more than a name, a logo, and a color palette. It's an expression of your mission, your values, and your vision, a plan to achieve your goals and ambitions, an experience that connects you with your customers, clients, employees, investors, and stakeholders, a system and the tools to build that connection over time. So it's really a whole blanket of everything. Think about even like your favorite TV show. If you're gonna pick your favorite TV show, you already have this feeling of how it's gonna make you feel. Or even like donuts, right? We're talking about donuts. Uh, you already know how it's going to make you feel. You're going to go down to your favorite donut shop and get donuts. You might go get donuts after this because we're going to talk about it so much. But the point is, is whatever you get in life and you pay your hard-earned money for, uh, you're going to happily pay it if you're already predicting what you're going to pay for and how it's going to make you feel, right? So that's what you have to kind of, the branding is how you're going to, how it's going to feel. Now, does anyone know what the difference is between marketing and branding? Anyone want to play in? No? Anyone feel lucky? <laughs> uh, so I was say, feel free to put your answers in the, in the chat as well. Um, so uh, if you don't want to speak out loud. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah. Branding is part of marketing. Uh, marketing has their components. It's true. Here's, here's the big thing. Uh, and something to remember. This is, uh, I'm back on the slide. There we go. Branding is what you will say to your audience. Marketing is how you will get in front of your audience. So yes, we all we talk about like a lot with, I talk about a lot of your groups, uh, a lot of the entrepreneurs I'm working with, a lot of my clients, they always wanna know how do I get to in front of my audience? Well, you get to in front of your audience through these channels, but once you're there, it's like, oh shoot, what do I say, right? Uh, and who do, how do I say it to this audience? Because 
it could, you're going to have a different audience on LinkedIn than you do on Instagram. Uh, you're going to have more of a, 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 a younger crowd per se on, on Instagram, more fun crowd, whereas LinkedIn is more business oriented. That's two separate audiences right there. Uh, that's not even considering everyone else you can consider, but that's something to remember because before you start to market, you have to think about the different audiences you have and what you're going to say to them, because this is what you want to train them to think of about your business. Okay. So as we move on, is it slow? There we go. So table of contents, we're going to talk about four things, personalization, your niche, your competition, and your street cred. But as you guys have most businesses, it's online cred, right? Um, so first off, personalization. This is how you're going to personalize. You know, it's hard to personalize on an online platform. You know, you're not really specifically seeing the person in front of you. You know, it's a lot different than retail uh, in, an, in a brick and mortar. So there's three parts to it. Um, there's segmenting your audience and then personalizing that experience. And then you have to scale it somehow because once you start growing, uh, you can't let that personalization die or at least go on the back burner. You can never have your personalization go on the back burner because that's when your brand starts to just get swept under the rug and you think sales are coming in, sales are great, but you're now not really spending time training those new people coming on. So you have to think about scaling it. So first off, segmenting your audience. Uh, it's the first question you need to answer is how you're gonna slice the audience into groups that are worth personalizing in the first place. Uh, you're going to have your obvious answers, which is these are your obvious three groups, and these get broken down as, as well. Your family, friends, coworkers, and colleagues. Now, these are the ones they know you best. They're going to, as soon as you create a group page, you're going to tell them you created a group page, and they're going to sign on no matter what. They don't care what it is, or they, you know, you're selling a new, uh, you're selling a new donut, and you have a new donut coming on. It's sprinkles uh, galore instead of uh, uh, instead of uh, icing galore. And they don't care. They're going to buy it because they like you and they want you to succeed. So these are great people to really reach out to uh, first because they're going to grow your audience and they're going to almost be an ambassador for you right away. Um, the second one I have here, the middle one is your target market. Now this is the one you're going to spend most time on. And this is uh, the toughest crowd because they're going to ask you the toughest questions. Um, this group is going to subdivide into three to five groups. And you're going to be the ones that, um, the target market is first off like prospects that you're trying to get. Um, then you got people that are that kind of like you, but they haven't sold yet. Uh, and then those people kind of can subdivide into groups depending on your platform. Uh, it could be a different age group or um, or gender or whatever else it is. Uh, you'll know as you start to think about these things. We'll go farther into it. And then everyone else. Uh, it's anyone you meet on meet from now on. This is important because, uh, for instance, when I had my business, it was a retail location. Uh, we would talk to the the US, UPS guy, the USPS guy, the FedEx guy, uh, all of my vendors. We talked to them like customers because uh, one day it was a couple years down the line. We had our USPS delivery guy delivers to all the bike shops in the area. There was five bike shops in a mile radius. He delivered to all of them. It's a couple of years, he came to us and I, I, I pulled him aside. I said, you know, you deliver all these other guys. Why do you come to us? He said, you guys are nice to me. I come in, you talk to me, you just say hi. And I said, the other guys don't do that? He said, no. I said, what? So just there it was like, boom. I was like, why isn't people doing this? And now this is, this is whoever you deal with, no matter if it's business or not. I go into Costco and, you know, just for practice, I'm getting rung up and I'm like, how's your day going? Do you know those people that ring you up? rarely get asked that question just think about it uh and my wife laughs at me because she does it now uh subconsciously because uh and she and she says it to me she's like you know i asked that person how their day was and she never did it before uh it makes both of you feel better it also opens up the conversation it remember it makes them remember you uh and it really practices you to get comfortable talking to other people uh, you never know when someone's going to convert and that's important so it doesn't matter who you talk to from now on, just you have to be open and you have to um, really just be the, try to think about it as you're trying to create a friend through every communication you have. So that's segmenting uh, your solution. This is how you can do it. Uh, so record yourself in front of a mirror, okay? 
uh, I like, I used to do this as well. Um, and just talk and don't even think about anything. Just push, push your cord. Don't think about anything else. And don't think about messing up and answer these questions, simple questions. Uh, what value are providing me? So in the mirror, you're talking first to your, to your mom, right? And then you're going to talk to uh, the random USPS guy. And then you're going to talk to the person serving you donuts. Uh, you're going to talk to everyone you think and just record it. Okay. And then you're going to say, um, you know, what's about, what are you going to tell me about your company? If you're going to Costco and you're asking the lady how, uh, how her day is, and then you, you're like, you know, I do this and she's doing this. And, and you start to talk about your company. You only have a few seconds to talk about your company before the next person in line wants to go. And they start giving you the, the, the tough eye, you know? So think about what you're going to say in a few words that really puts you out in front of the competition. And this is important. I used to sit on the bike paths and have bananas. I only had a few seconds for those people to ride their bike by to say something really quick. So I had like, like a, a five sentence or five, a five word sentence that got them to stop. Uh, and it wasn't about bananas. It was about something else, you know, about their chain being dry. It was about something about bikes, you know, separately from whatever I'm selling, but you got to think about that. You know, you think about their pain points and, and that's going to really share subliminally share a, your company to them. Um, and this is going to, what you want the audience to know about you. You know, this is all encompasses how you're going to talk about your company and it should just fluently come out of your mouth. And to do that, you have to just continue to talk about your company. Nowadays it's hard to, because we're all stuck in the house. So it's really this, this exercise in front of the mirror is good. Um, put pictures, you can print pictures. Like, it's just like people talk about getting in front of a big group. You're talking in front of a group of people. And, uh, and the best thing to do is, is stick a picture of your mom in front of the camera and, you, and it makes you more comfortable. Whatever you can do, it doesn't matter. No one's going to judge you. There's no judging. Here's no right or wrong. Uh, you need to get comfortable. And this is going to segment. This is going to figure out uh, from here. You do this every audience that you can think of. And then you watch yourself talking about your business. You take notes from you watching yourself and you can see what you have to improve on. You might skip on some things or some of your features you might, you know, uh, fall back on. You might uh, not, uh, you might not, not say your features correctly as you want to, to say it. So this is ways you can judge your own self. Uh, and you are the best judge of yourself. And that's the only judge there should be. Um, and this is going to end up being a copy message. And this is how you're going to talk to your segmented audiences. This is how you can build your email uh, funnels if you want to build funnels or at least uh, segmentation of different groups. Because sitting down writing campaigns is very difficult. But if you can automatically do it from what you're, vi what you're actually talking about, uh, it's very easy to build it. So next up, uh, personalize that experience. Uh, if you ever heard of Optimizely, uh, world's leader for customer experience optimization. When they started out in 2015, they showed how you can customize a homepage banner based on the user's location of current weather, which is brilliant. So someone, someone, um, so you can have an umbrella sale for users who are experiencing rainy days or a jacket sale for people experiencing cold weather on the same exact day. So someone from Canada is logging on and it's cold and they're going to have a jacket on their homepage, whereas someone from Florida is going to have uh, an umbrella, right? So uh, this is a brilliant thing you can do. Uh, it, it's, it's also not the answer, but it's just an example, right? Uh, this is an example of when they land as a prospect. Um, so a personalized customer experience is more than just targeted email campaigns and advertisements. It's the ability to approach and react to each customer individually throughout the customer's journey. And it's one sign of a flourishing customer experience management program. And this is the hard part, right? Uh, solution to personalized experience, uh, map out and walk through the customer journey across all channels in your customer's shoes. This is after your recording and all this other stuff, you can think about those steps as if you're walking through in their shoes. Evaluate whether those elements of the personalization help, hurt, or don't affect how the customer views your business. And these are the questions you can ask yourself, does you know, what you're saying in front of the mirror when you uh, take notes on it, um, is it helping? or is it hurting your business, or is it doesn't affect it at all? Ideally, you want to pick those things that help it. You want to always add value to your prospect. If you're always adding value, then you're branding yourself for them to always know that if they see your face or they see your, your company name, they're going to always give me value. And that's, that's a great experience. Uh, so 
scaling the personalization. This is the hardest part. I think no one really has a true answer to this, but if you're focusing on it, then you can't do wrong. Uh, tracking what is working and what is not uh, also becomes difficult. For example, say you've got one audience segment that is underperforming. Uh, does it mean that your personalization strategy is off? Or that segment simply uh, is less apt to convert? Possibly, but making sweeping changes across the site can cause havoc to a personalization setup that is already in place, uh, forcing you to start from scratch. So when you do these things, you want to really take time and do small changes. You know, you might, you might be frustrated that uh, none of this personalization to this one audience is converting. Well, you don't want to start over because again, you know how much work it was to get there. So do small things. You can reach out to these people and ask them and do some market research. This is great stuff to ask them. You know, what is, what do you like about my company? What value am I giving you? What value would you like to see? You know, and that would help you scale it. Um, so uh, use the personalization strategies as a way to learn about your visitors rather than purely a way to increase return on investment. This value of insights tends to be evergreen. This means unlike a quick conversation win. So you're not worried about just conversating with the customer sometimes. You, you're really interested about listening. If you're listening to the customer exactly what they want, and if this is the ideal customer you want, you need to know everything about how they feel uh, about your message. Uh, the secret to truly understanding and implementing effective personalization throughout marketing uh, lies in understanding the user behavior and their profile. Uh, once marketers fully understand customer preferences and the data points associated, they're able to better segment this information, creating the opportunity for authentic communication. No matter how big you scale, you could continue to do this, okay? Next up, how to carve your niche. Uh, this is big. Uh, the logic is simple. Catering to a larger market or audience will require the investment of more marketing dollars to reach that market as well as more technology or personnel to satisfy their needs if and when you do reach them. So you'll hear a lot of businesses say, uh, you know, at the beginning, uh, we're a mile wide and an inch deep because they'll say yes to everything. You know, everyone's their customer. That's true because you're trying to grow. But very quickly you have to niche down because saying yes to everyone is going to cost a lot of time and money. Uh, so a niche helps the business set apart and helps it hook the customers by catering to specific needs. Uh, this pushes other businesses to niche down. Uh, this is, when you niche down, make the best of it and scale your business within that niche. Only then you should invest within the market. So it will take time to niche down. You Right now, you may say, oh, I know exactly who my market is. But uh, you might surprise yourself. Uh, for instance, when I'm a business when I started, I thought it was the weekend warriors. We called the weekend warriors the people that rode their bikes every weekend. Yes, that was my market, but I didn't think I'd pick up the triathletes, uh, which were a different market, but I did. And it was a whole other market. I had to learn how they how they purchase and how what they do on the weekends, uh, and, and separate from our weekend warriors, right? It's just, a, just an example. Um, or as a donuts example, you don't know if these people are coming every day for donuts or if they're gonna come in when their kid has a birthday and buy donuts once a year. Uh, you think it's going to be the people that come in every day, but it might just be the moms and dads that are coming in once a year. Now you have to market just to them because those are the ones buying lots of donuts at every time. So uh, this is what you're going to figure out as you niche down and figure out your actual market. Now, know your competition. This is big. Every year, I would have one of my, uh, one of my guys, and it was actually fun, ex <laughs> one of my guys that always loved to do it, but we'd call uh, 40 of the top bike shops in town as a customer uh, and ask them their prices and ask and I would ask my employee to say what is a bicycle tune-up what does it cost and what does it involve now subconsciously I didn't tell them this but what would happen was at the end of the 40 calls they would also understand their customer experience because most of the time they go man they were not that nice on the phone or they were very nice on the phone or they didn't have any time, or they didn't understand. So what you find is just the one question, you're gonna contact your, just email your top competitor as a customer. Um, you can do that. It's, 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 first, it's, uh, it's completely lawful. You don't have, it does, you're not like faking anything. You, you're interested in their service. Uh, that's it, you're market researching. Uh, what would we find out is that, number one, we were in a good market for price. Number two, you're understanding how they're communicating with their customer base and how they're training their employees to, to communicate. And that's important because 
if all your if all your competition is amazing at at answering you and and responding to you then you got a tough sale but if half of them um, never respond to you or they're short with you or something like that then you have an easy sell because your client base that's contacting your your competition you're gonna stand out from them so these are questions you can answer what services do they offer uh, what is their chief focus can you profitably target the ones they don't uh, what advantages do you offer or do they offer uh, don't try to duplicate your competitors advantages unless you could do it better that's important uh, because there's a lot of people who do things great here in this world uh, and and that's knowing what they do great and separating that is important you don't want to try to beat that um, especially if they've been in the market for a long time uh, what is the main message they communicate uh, in their market or in the marketing materials how they position themselves what niche are they picking uh, what is the reputation or image in the industry? Uh, you can see this by a lot of the, your, everyone I'm talking to has an online, actually 99, probably 90% 90 of you guys have an online business. So you could see the reputation with online reviews and stuff like that uh, and social media. Uh, also, can you own a position differentiated from theirs? For instance, if they're an 800 pound gorilla with vast resources and experiences, can you be the nimble spider monkey willing and able to do more yes you're smaller you're gonna say yes to a lot more people but can you wedge yourself in there uh, alongside that 800 pound gorilla and grow next to it and, and answer those questions that those prospects from that 800 800 pound gorilla are answering but not quite correctly uh, so that's what you got to find out this is the, the competition is very difficult uh, especially in the online world and it's very easy to find out about your competition in the online world so this is an important uh, task and, and, and job to do within the company and do it uh, once a year, I like to say, uh, because things change a lot. Uh, last up, building your street cred or online cred like most people here. Um, avoid selling a solution that isn't in the customer's best interest. Now, when I talk about street cred, this is again what people are gonna think about you as a business. Uh, when they think about your name, this is what we kind of talked about at the beginning. What are they going to expect from you when they see your brand name, when they see your face, when they see you talk, when they see a social media post? So avoid selling a solution that isn't the customer's best interest. You might say, look, uh, our solution is not the best. You could say that. And they're going to value you so much more because now you're looking out for their best interest and you're just trying to sell them a solution that you know is not going to be the best. Uh, that used to be the sales pitch in the 90s, uh, all the way up until the late 90s, early 2000s. It's now changed into adding this value. So if you're the one uh, to, to pick up that phone and, and or email when they send an email, most likely now, uh, or text, whatever it is, they're going to ask you a question. And if they're going to be a prospect, and you're like, wow, they're going to really be interested. And you start to talk to them and you find out their, their problem, you are not really the best one to solve. If you send them a URL like, hey, look, these guys, you know, they're competition, but they're going to solve your problem better than us. Do you know how much value that gives? I mean, think about it when you would call, I don't know, uh, say you call this donut place, right? You want donuts for your kid's birthday uh, or your friend's birthday. Because most people don't have kids here. Say your friend's birthday, you're buying a dozen donuts. Well, say your friend's allergic to peanuts, uh, like I am. Uh, well, guess what? Well, uh, this donut place said, sorry, we, sometimes we put some peanuts in some things. Here's a number to the place that actually doesn't use any nuts. I'll go, great. And you know what? I'm going to call them next time for, 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 uh, um, for advice because they were so clear and truthful, right? Uh, number two, never misinterpret the features or advantages and benefits of your product or service. This kind of goes along with it but you don't want to upsell them on anything that you don't really, uh, you can't come through on. Uh, that comes with number three, don't promise anything you can't deliver. Uh, and this, you know, don't get hung up on it in the sense that, uh, yes, you're saying yes to everyone, but there's a point when you just say, look, we can't do that. Uh, maybe we'll do it in the future. Uh, we got it on the, you know, our update will come next year and we'll do that. I'll, I'll keep you in the loop. I'll put your number down, but remember not to promise anything you can't deliver. Uh, number four, accepting or offering bribes or gifts is always unethical. 
there's a lot of businesses. <laughs> I roll my eyes a little bit. There's a lot of businesses. This is important with an online business. There's a lot of businesses in the blue collar field, uh, you know, electrical, construction, uh, automotive, and they trade a lot of services. Now, again, that was very big back in past life. Uh, nowadays, it's not. You, what you're doing when you trade, you're devaluing your service. Uh, you're not, you're not, you're trading because they might be worth just as much as you are, but on paper, it's not. When you go to just trade, it's, it's not really an ethical way of doing business now. Um, you want to, you want to trade your business for money and then give that money back for their service. It's, it's the best way to do it on paper with a paper trail and, and bookkeeping and everything else. It's actually the ideal way to do it. Um, so think about that. Number five, keeping your prices consistent through all departments within the same company. You'll see this a lot in partnerships. You might have like a friend or something that wants to come on the platform and you're like, look, our price is $79 a month, but you know, you're my friend. I'll give it to $49 a month. That friend goes out and tells another friend. He's like, look, I got it for $49 a month. You should call uh, my buddy. And then, you know, they call and they don't get their buddy and they go, I got to talk to this one guy because they give me the price that again is going to set your business up for failure. So you want to make sure your prices are consistent and you stay on point with the prices. Don't devalue yourself. You're worth it. Okay. Someone's going to pay for it. There's people out there that'll pay for your service. Um, uh, number six, when problems develop after sale, don't make excuses. Don't blame, uh, d don't place blame, fix the problem. I see a lot of businesses that I deal with, uh, throughout my life and you, I'm sure you've dealt with them too. Um, for instance, the donuts, uh, I eat a donut and, uh, say it has peanuts in it. I'm screwed. I have to go to the hospital because I'm allergic to peanuts. Um, if they come fix the problem, they're going to come to me and say, Stu, I'm really sorry. I thought I didn't have any peanuts. Uh, you know, I'll give you a, a, a one year free donut, uh, card. Okay, great. I, I appreciate, I appreciate that. Or if they come back instead, what if they said, uh, that wasn't us. I, I swear that wasn't us. That, that had nothing to do with us. Uh, donut, we didn't use peanuts. It, it wasn't us. I mean, how does it make me feel right? I'm not gonna tell my friends to go there. Uh, so humans are humans. Humans make humans our problems. We're, we're all a problem. Uh, we create problems. We're trying to create solutions to their businesses, but you get the best customers when you actually mess something up and you fix it because only a business, only a true customer will value your business. If you know how to make a, a mistake, right? Uh, I had the best customers in my last business because I would never let anyone leave without finishing the conversation. If they weren't happy with the price, I'd, I'd follow them out to the parking lot and we talk about it. Uh, I had this one lady, um, you know, a lot of people with retail, they come in with their emotions. So, you know, she, she was not happy with the prices. I followed her out. She ended up crying on my shoulder. I hugged her for a while. I had never expected it. But the point is, is um, you're trying to talk to them as a human and yeah, you're trying to make the sale because we all have to eat. But at the end of the day, I sleep a lot better and you'll sleep a lot better if you're making that relationship and not just worry about the sale. Um, uh, I used to tell my guys all the time, if, if that person walks out of the, out of the shop and you don't make the sale, but you know who their wife is and where their kids play soccer and what they do on a Friday night, then you did make the sale because they're going to come back and see you. So don't make excuses, uh, own up to it. Just say, sorry. It's going it, it, to, you, you're going to be vulnerable. It's going to, you know, nobody wants to do that, but it's going to happen. We're all human. Uh, number seven, don't withhold bad news. Uh, so if something's not going to go right, like a lot of people have pl uh, uh, online platforms uh, on this, in this uh, community, uh, on this, in this innovation uh, lab, everybody has a, a online platform. Uh, if say, for instance, the most thing that happened is your, your platform's down uh, or it could be going down or this update didn't go through right. And you know, it's not going to go through up right. It's not going to go through right. You can reach out to those, uh, those users and say, look, we got something going on. Uh, I appreciate your patience. We'll be back soon. Let me know if you need anything. You know, being fully communicated before something happens or while it happens is very huge. Um, they're going to feel connected with your business even more. Number eight, if, uh, if and when you speak to the competition, be respectful at all times. This is big. People come in to my business and say, I, I didn't like them because they didn't do this and that. And I would go, look, 
there's a lot of great people that work there. Maybe it was just a bad day. You know, um, they're going to come to you and say, I, I was signed up for this platform and I emailed them and they never emailed back. And I want you because you emailed me back real quick and you're answering all my questions. And first thing you say is, look, it's probably a great company. Uh, I, I've, I know that company. They're friends with them. Um, they're going through some changes and that's it. You never want to be like, you, you don't want to agree with them and say, yeah, that was a, that's a bad company. You never want to say that. Uh, you don't want to talk down as much as politicians and everything else like to talk down everyone in a business sense. It's really good to just really talk good about your competition. It doesn't hurt anything. Uh, number eight, uh, I'm sorry. Number nine, uh, responding coming messages within 24 to 48 hours. This is a big one. Um, I'm sure you guys probably know, but, uh, even 24 hours or even if someone, if even someone emails you at the beginning of the day and it's before, I always like to say if it's before 12, they should get a response within that same day. Uh, if it's after lunchtime, you can go with the next day. Um, this is big because if they're going to respond pretty quickly, they, uh, especially in the online world, they're, um, they're shopping around and it's very easy to sit down to a computer and shop your 10 hardest competition right there in 10 minutes. So if you are responding to a question they have, a prospect or even a customer um, to a concern and you're responding very quickly, you're branding yourself as someone's going to answer their question quickly. Now, um, it doesn't hurt you in the sense that today you respond to them in an hour and tomorrow you respond to them in 24 hours. You're responding to them quickly and that's important. Uh, lastly, build a relationship, not a sale. We've talked a little bit about this, but you're not selling, you're building relationships because every customer you get is going to be an ambassador of your brand. Think about it. Uh, someone's going to download your app or they're going to sign up for your plan. If they love you, they're going to tell their friends. Okay. So that's what you have to think about. Um, Jeff Bezos, I love this guy, everybody knows him, Amazon. A brand for a company is like a reputation for a person. You earn reputation by trying to do the hard things well. So this is not gonna be easy, but if you're thinking about it, again, you're ahead of 64% of these businesses out there. Lastly, it's okay to get frustrated with building your brand. It's actually a great sign because it takes time to answer the hard questions. It may take years to get your branding right, but you must continue to work on it because it's a mandatory challenge to conquer for your company to grow strong into the future. So it will adapt, it, you will change, you're gonna, you're gonna have to adapt, you're gonna have to evolve your brand as you start to learn more about your customers. Um, so it will take time, it's not gonna be overnight, you could sit down the night and start it, but you're gonna continue to, to work on it and it might be awesome in a year, but it's gonna be even better in another year and you continue to work on it. And like I said, you should be working on it at least eight hours a week. It sounds like a lot, but the branding comes with marketing. If you're branding, you're kind of marketing, but don't think about marketing first. I always like to think about branding because if you're thinking about what you're saying to these people, then the marketing comes. It just comes with it. It's, it's going to just follow along through. Um, that's it. Thank you. Uh, Anyone any questions? Uh, also, uh, before I stop my office hours, Tuesday nights at 8.30 to 9.30, I know it's nighttime, but any business owner will tell you, uh, you're working Tuesday nights on your business. So if you have any questions, uh, I'm always available at that time. I'll help you with your branding or message or anything like that. You can shoot it by me. Uh, I'd love to talk to you about it. Uh, and then the credit goes to slidego.com. If you ever want to do slides, uh, this is a killer uh, free um, uh, app and then free pick was was all the picks. So thank you guys. And I love to just, uh, we, we have a bunch of time. I love doing questions and answering any questions you got. I love it. We were, uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Stu. It's so funny. We were trying so hard to, to you know, be short in the time and we still have about only 10 minutes left. <laughs> <laughs> but we got, got so much great, so much great information there. So uh, were there any questions in the chat, Carmen? We might have lost her. No, there, there are not questions right now. Okay, so uh, if anybody has any questions, you're welcome to put them into the chat or you can just um, unmute yourselves and ask. Uh, just a quick thingy. Yeah, so I posted um, SurveyMonkey for Rec and also posted Stu's feedback form, which is a little different from what I've been posting earlier. So I'll post it again in the chat right now. So if you can answer 
uh, both of them, that would be great. Oh, so this yeah. is another form? Okay. Uh, yeah, my, well, yeah, the second one's even more important than the first one because um, I've only done a lot of these, so uh, I love your feedback, and that would tell me what I need to do to improve on the next one. Oh, great, great. Uh, absolutely. We will uh, absolutely do that, and we will be also providing you the feedback from the other. So, um, great. Yeah, I see uh, Rohan said that he'll definitely be watching the recording again later. Any other uh, questions or comments from the audience? Uh, I actually have a question. Hi, Stu. Thanks for donating your time. Uh, my name is Enzo. So I was wondering, um, like, an estimate of how long I should be spending on my branding. You said it takes time and it's hard, and this is something that I, I noticed. But how do I know when I'm overthinking? Basically, that's that's what I, I'm trying to ask. Uh, good question. Um, I think, like I said, I would do an hour a day, and it sends a lot. But at the beginning, when you're not having sales, you got to be pretending you're having sales. You got to be pretending you're talking about your, your your brand. So, spend an hour push record and spend an hour talking, and then the next night uh, sleep on it. The next night you spend an hour watching that recording, and you take notes about how you talk to uh, the camera and what you said. And then the following you sleep on that. The next night you do it again, and you'll start to see your message will just flow out of your mouth very fluently. And that's at the point you have to get to. I guess your branding becomes fluent. Uh, it will always evolve, like I said, but it will become very natural for you and you won't second guess it once your recording gets um, almost familiar with its own self. So you, all, you push record, you know exactly what to say to each audience. Um, generally the same, but you're going you're to you know, tweak it a little bit per audience. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. That was yeah. great. Appreciate it. Yeah. And I, just to add something there, I, I've, I found that because of this new digital world that we live in, we have, like the, we have the ability to compete with existing companies with tons of money, tons of reach, and we can do just as good or better just with, with sweat equity, with time. Yeah. And so if you're not spending you know, time as, um, on your marketing and a lot of time in your marketing, then I mean, you're just shooting yourself in the foot. You're wasting just such a golden gift that you don't even realize what a gift it is. If you come from, you know, some of us, some of us that are older, uh, remember what it was like when you had to pay for really expensive, you know, ads in order to get any traction. Now you can just, all it takes is time, energy, and knowing what you're doing and gosh, take advantage of that. Yeah. I mean, that's right. If you have money, I was, I mean, I knocked on doors, you know, and you don't have to do it anymore. You know, you, you get on social media, you make a post, you can get the thousands of people at once. Right. Uh, so yeah. Uh, and the hour a day, if you're not selling, if you're not selling your, 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 whatever you're selling an hour a day, then you need to be talking about it an hour a day anyway, because <laughs> It, if you think about it, when you get busy, think about where you're going to be. What's your end goal? Well, your end goal is to be selling your product all the time. But if you're selling, you know, selling your product all the time, you got to start from somewhere. And starting from talking about it every day, at least an hour a day, uh, it's like playing the guitar. If you're going to, you're going to be great at it if you spend an hour a day at any musical instrument, right? Anything, yeah. Awesome. Um, well, Stu, you. I'm not sure if you can see the. Um, the chat box, but there's a question um, from VC and it's asking. How would you build? Um, oh yeah, uh, how would one build a global versus regional brand? Hence the marketing strategy. Brand transcends across products, and when you uh, dissociate or associate brand uh, with a product, uh, it's a good. It's um, so VC. You're selling a. Are you selling a global brand? Right. You're selling something global? Vivek? Uh, he's selling something global? Yes, he says he is selling something in the global market. Yeah, so global's tough. You have to go by, it is, it is region. Um, you have to think about, well, you have to think about what kind of holiday. First off, you could think about what holidays are going on. You know, Chinese holidays are different than European holidays. So you could talk about something that goes along with that uh, to relate. You need to figure out how to relate to your global market. And yes, you're gonna to have to segment them first by country. Uh, and then what's going on in that country? You know, it could be politics or um, like holidays is very easy because people are very happy in holidays. If you can reach them on holidays in any way, um, congratulate them on the holiday, talk to them. Uh, that's big if you ever think about that. Um, but seg uh, 
associating with the brand on social media. It's a little about that social media. You never want to sell your product. It, it, there's a lot of argument against that, but you want to talk about your brand, um, what you're doing, the daily stuff, but you never want to say like, here, buy my shampoo or buy my platform. You can in some ways, but you never want to focus on it because, um, you want to always have presence. And when you have presence on social media, if you're posting every day, you might get one or two likes, but you, you can see actually, the, you might see 50 people saw it. Well, there's 50 thumbs that scroll through there and it doesn't matter if they liked it or not. They're going to continue to see your brand as a, you know, the pictures you post and they're going to like it over time. Uh, if you're posting something nice, you remember like, I get sold to. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, remember like a phone only, everybody's on a phone. A phone only has on social media, you have one or one and a half pictures. People are going to stop or they're going to like it and they're not going to defriend you or something if the picture is actually like nice, it looks good. It makes their phone look good. Think about it. You know, you're going to look at pictures that are, um, you know, subpar. You're, you know, think about like the pictures that Instagram actually posts or Facebook actually posts. They're, they're really uh, powerful pictures. So think about what you're posting uh, and don't, don't worry about the product. Uh, if you got your name on it and you're just posting something that's relevant, then you're going to get exposure. Right. And, and nobody wants to get sold to, right? Especially in social right. media. They want, they want to see stories about you. They want to see you know, interesting things that are happening. And then also right. one thing too, like you were talking about Stu, um, in the beginning, we're very, very niche. And typically we don't have more than maybe one product and that's, that's okay. That's good. So we should be um, promoting our brand, not our products in the beginning. Anyway. That's right. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. So great. Uh, any other questions? I think we have just a two minutes more. Any other announcements? Or I have a quick question. Please go ahead. Um, Stu, wonderful presentation. I totally enjoyed it. Okay, um, good. I am curious about branding when it comes to branding. I'm re I'm rebranding. So okay. what I initially started out with, um, I'm pretty much changing everything, like the the concepts, colors, like everything is changing. And so I'm curious to know when you're rebranding, like how do you make sure that your focus stays stays true to what you're trying to put your identity out there as, like your brand awareness? Yeah, that's a good question. Do you have customers already? No. <laughs> okay. So it's, it's easier. Because if you had customers, yes. it's harder because they, you know, you're trying to train them. But, um, so you're, you, you're rebranding, um, all the stuff on your website, but the message, your whole message is changing. Um, yes. The, the, um, the approach is changing. Okay. Um, it, it's going from kind of like, almost like a live to a blog instead of, um, like a group setting. I'm just going to do blogging. Okay. Uh, so you mean how you're going to, so branding, you're rebranding. Well, you're not really, I guess if you don't have customers, you're just branding again, right? I mean, you're just, you're starting branding Technically, over. Technically, yes. Yeah. So that's, it gets easier per se. If you're rebranding, it's harder to train customers over, but um, you're branding. So think about, this is what I like to do is first, you could first off study um, if you can get anyone that, that you're attracted, that attracts to you, start to ask them what kind of blogs they like now. Uh, because what you're trying to do is look at your competition at, at, the, at what they're doing for branding and uh, find out their customer journey at this moment and see how you can kind of finagle yourself in there. So thinking about rebranding, um, you're, you're not copying a, a, um, a competition. You're thinking about how they are uh, using the customer journey and how those customers are funneled through the journey. And that journey, is it consistent or is there changes and how you can fit inside that journey? And that's going to answer your questions of how you're going to brand yourself to uh, bring those people over to your journey. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes, it does. Yeah. So I, uh, once again, I just want to thank everybody for coming and let you know. We thank have you. Lots more workshops. Yeah. Thank you so much, Charlize. Thank you, Stu. Thank you. Thank you. To the team who put this together. And Stu, would you like to take us out with uh, any final thought? Uh, always think about branding and always make a relationship. Always make relationships. Wonderful. Agreed. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. We will see you again next time from the rest. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Thanks. Do you want to do a photo? I think I